We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Nick Giambruno, founder of the Financial Underground and editor-in-chief of its premium investment research publication, Financial Underground Speculator. Nick, thanks for joining me again today. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Tom. Great to be with you. So you recently penned an article with a quote from Henry Ford, and I you know, he says it so well, and I thought we could kind of start there. And he said, it is well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. So do you think this misunderstanding by most of the banking system is due to the system working for most people for a good amount of time? Uh, yeah, but it's a facade. It's a charade. Uh, it's a scam, frankly. Uh, and I always tell people, you know, there are three things you need to keep in mind about the banking system. One, the money is not uh, yours. Two, the money is not there. And three, the money is not even money. And I think it's it's uh, worthwhile to just kind of dig into these things uh, because these are some very basic fundamental truths about modern banking that just, you th those are indisputable facts, what I just said, those three things, but most people have no idea. So the money isn't yours and that's number one. It's not yours. People conflate that money in the bank is like somehow equivalent to having like a hundred dollar bill in your hand. It's absolutely not. What you have in the bank is an IOU from the bank. That's a very, very, very different thing than having uh, an unencumbered uh, asset in your hand. So basically what that means is, is that you're an unsecured uh, uh, creditor of the bank. You're making a loan to the bank and they're giving you a piddly amount of interest uh, to make up for that. It's a very terrible deal uh, for you and a very good deal for the bankers. Uh, you know, and also this is not, this is a, there's a legal distinction too. Once you give money to the bank, it is legally no longer your money. It is the bank's money and they get to do whatever they want with it. And there's nothing, really nothing you can do about it. Um, they can also freeze your account. They can, uh, you know, do all sorts of things to your account. So it's, it's really, it's really not your money. It's really the bank's money and you have to ask for their permission to use it. That's abundantly clear. That's number one. Number two, the money's not even there. It's not there. So even if it was your money, it's not there. They they banks uh, have institutionalized uh, a system of fraud, frankly, uh, called fractional reserve banking. Uh, I mean, the easiest way to think of this is, is to think of it as uh, in in other industries. So imagine if there was a fractional reserve car dealership or a fractional reserve jewelry store that created 10x the amount of claims to the cars that were actually in the dealership lot that they were selling or 10x the amount of watches in a jewelry store that they were selling. Or another way to think of it is, imagine you owned a stadium and you sold 10x the amount of tickets for the seats in the stadium. That's what these guys are doing in the bank. I mean, ever since this COVID hysteria, which uh, removed kind of like one of the last vestiges of control on the fractional reserve system, there's been no requirements to have any reserves whatsoever in banks. Banks are not required to have any money on reserve for depositors. That is insane. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if only a small fraction of depositors came up to the bank and said, I'd like my money back, please. It's not there. The money is not there. They've loaned it out. They've done all sorts of things. So it's a giant Ponzi scheme. It's really a Ponzi scheme, uh, modern banking. Uh, the only reason it kind of lasts longer is because it's backstopped by the central bank. Whenever banks get in trouble, whenever their Ponzi scheme starts to unravel, the central bank steps in as the quote unquote lender of last resort. Well, it translated into English, that means it's a counterfeiting operation to prop up a Ponzi scheme. That's all it is. So the money's not there. And uh, the only reason the facade goes on so long is because it's backstopped by the money printer, counterfeiting basically, which is another fraud. <laughs> so that's number two. And number three, the money is not even money. It's confetti, it's fake money. Uh, money is supposed to be something that emerges from the market. And it's not a complicated thing. These, these, these clowns try to gaslight you into thinking that money is so complicated that only PhDs and uh, you know these high government priests can tell you what money is. This is absolutely not true. Money is very simple and intuitive. It's simply a, a, a tool for storing and exchanging value. That's all money is. There's nothing other than that. That's it. It's very simple. You could teach a toddler 
uh, what that means. So it's 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 ridiculous to think that you know it's it's so complicated that we have to have these high priests in the government deal deal with this topic for us. Absolutely not true. So what is what is the money that everybody takes for granted today? Fiat money. It's just money that governments and and central banks create out of thin air. They just make it into existence. It would be as if uh, you, Tom, could uh, use pieces of paper with your signature on it and force everybody at gunpoint to use that as money. It's a scam. Imagine if you could just sign a piece of paper and be like, okay, I'm going to pay for my groceries with this. This is basically what governments are doing. It's a humongous scam. So those are the three things about the banking system. Uh, money's not yours. The money's not there. And the money's not money. And uh, if people understood this, I think that quote from uh, Henry Ford would would really, uh, really ring true. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we should be separating the ideas of money and currency? Then? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, look, I know there's a distinction between the two, but 99.99% of people have no clue. Uh, yes, money, uh, you, you, you should have a distinguish, uh, we should distinguish between money and currency. Money is just... Uh, it has no uh, has no counterparty risk. It's think of money like physical gold in your hand. That's money. You don't depend on anybody else to use it. In the same sense, you could say the same about Bitcoin that you store your keys with. It's the same kind of concept in that it's an asset without a counterparty risk. Uh, and that's kind of what money is. Currency, on the other hand, is a derivative of money, and that's kind of used in, in, for convenience. So it's not the same thing. Uh, so now we don't even have real money. We have currency. Uh, and there's no money behind the currency. It's just unbacked currency. That's what we have today with fiat currency. It's a scam of uh, incomprehensible proportions. Um, I saw this thing recently. The, uh, the Somebody in New Zealand was talking about the quote unquote business of central banking. And it made me think, what kind of business is this? This is a, not a normal business that central bankers are engaged in. Uh, and it's, it's I'll just simplify it. What we have here is an entity that creates fake money out of thin air. They loan it to the government. They charge the government interest. And in order for the government to pay the interest on the money that the central banks created out of thin air, they have to put coercive taxation on regular citizens to take that wealth and pay the interest on the money that was created out of thin air to the central bankers. It's really like you're a cattle on a tax farm and the central bankers are running a tax farming operation really it's a it's an awful 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 thing i hope it goes away very soon because it's a horrible thing for human freedom it's a horrible thing for economic freedom uh it's really degrading uh and it's 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 a really rotten scam that not many people are aware of but a growing number are so that's that is encouraging that more people are starting to figure this out mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting the way that you put that the high priests in the government or the high priests, let's say from the central bank, you know, I think, you know, the general population has a sense that these people are all knowing and infallible and they know exactly what they're doing. Yet, I think we have plenty of examples that they're, you know, they're exactly the opposite. So what are some examples of, let's say, banking failures that stick out in your mind that people should keep in mind when thinking about this topic? Bank failures? Well, you look at the, the Silicon Valley bank failure from last year. You know why that bank failed? It wasn't because they were necessarily doing anything uh, with like a risky uh, loan portfolio. It failed because of, uh, largely because of their treasury holdings, treasuries, U.S. treasuries, U.S. bonds. These are supposed to be the safest assets in the financial system. They're supposed to be the bedrock. They're supposed to be like the, the base layer of the fiat system. And that was what one of the main factors that caused Silicon Valley to go bankrupt is because they had losses on their <laughs> treasuries because the interest rates have gone. It's the uh, interest rates, when they go up, they make the value of a bond go down. So we are in the middle of a, I think it's, I actually think it's over, frankly, but we we have just gone through the one of the steepest rate hike cycles in American history in the past two years or so. That has devastated bonds, uh, which are in treasuries in particular. So I think that should stick out to you and on just how rotten, just how unsound, just how wobbly the banking system is, is that Silicon Valley Bank failed in large part because of its losses on its treasuries. That means all these banks have a very similar pro uh, problem. So, yeah, I, I, I think people need to be very, very, very careful with the banks. I think they're horrible long-term savings vehicles. Uh, 
in any case. So I would not recommend anybody put long-term savings in a bank. There's, you know, generously, you can use it for month to month uh, expenditures and put your long-term savings uh, somewhere else because it's just a, it's just so fundamentally unsound and fundamentally uh, rotten, frankly. Well, I think we need to keep, let's say, make a distinction here. And I want to get your thoughts on what is a bigger threat as you see it, a banking collapse or capital controls that can be imposed at their will? Uh, well, I think the, they're both very big threats. Uh, they're both. So what is the bigger threat? Um, I think the bigger threat to most people is going to be bank failures. But that is not to say capital controls are not a, a serious threat either. They are a serious threat. They're often they're often used in tandem because when there's bank failures or financial troubles or financial crises, countries typically turn to capital controls, which means they just put restrictions on how you can use your money. Uh, they they come can come in many different flavors of how you, the restrictions of of how you can use your money. But nonetheless, they are restrictions on. Uh, you can't take your money out of the country. You can't buy gold. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, th these things kind of go hand in hand. So if there is a big banking crisis, I absolutely would expect uh, there to be capital controls too. So the idea is to be prepared for these things before they happen, because you can't really do anything about them once they've happened. You've got to act uh, before these things happen. So um yeah, you really want to want to take uh, proactive measures before uh, you, you see that your bank is in trouble or that the government is thinking about uh, putting capital controls on. Nick, I want to go back to something that you said a moment ago that you think the rate hiking cycle is over. What makes you, you know, feel that way, especially considering that we got another higher than expected CPI print and obviously the inflation fight is not over? No, it's not. And actually, uh, the Fed is throwing in the towel. What I, I believe the Fed is, is going to be throwing in the towel uh, soon. Uh, they've already paused their rate hikes. And the reason is simple is because of the interest expense on the federal debt, because they can't, the higher the interest rate goes, that they raise the rate, the higher the interest expense is on the uh, on the federal debt. Yeah, so that's a very big reason why they don't have much more runway uh, to raise interest rates, because they're going to bankrupt the federal government already. According to the government's own statistics, the federal interest expense is going to exceed $1 trillion this year for the first time ever. Uh, and it has a compounding effect because the higher the, uh, the, the, the interest rate is, the more interest expense and the higher the deficit is, the more borrowing it takes to pay to, to fund the deficit. The higher the interest expense, because there's more debt to fund the deficit. It's it's like it's like a it's like a self reinforcing doom loop, and they definitely are in into this uh, this debt. It's a debt spiral. This is the debt spiral, and I think it's finally here. People have been talking about it for a long time, but I think it's very clear that it's here now. In short, they're borrowing money to pay interest on the debt they've already borrowed, and that's what's going on right now. And it's compounding. This isn't linear growth. This is like exponential growth. So one thing that's tricky about exponential. Growth growth is that it looks like it's kind of flat for a long time and then it just shoots off. So I think we're at that inflection point uh, for, for that reason. I mean, we're already at a trillion dollars in interest. That means the interest expense on the federal debt is going to soon become the largest budget item. It's going to become larger than the, the Department of Defense. It'll be larger. All, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, that's all within spitting distance of the size of uh, the interest expense on the federal debt, which will certainly go up. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, they're really running out of room here. And I don't want to, I don't know what kind of crap they're going to pull, capital controls, currency debasement. It's not going to be good. I know it's not going to be good. And I know it's going to have a confiscatory effect on wealth. Uh, so I want to take uh, proactive measures uh, now because there's not much time left, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the most important part of that, or one of the most important parts, is this idea that you brought up about the exponential growth curve of that debt and the interest to be paid on it. That is not a natural way for humans to be able to think about extrapolating something into the future. And then all of a sudden it just shooting up and doubling and doubling and doubling is, you know, an unnatural way to be able to think about things. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 absolutely true. So um, that's what we have here and it is compounding on each other. So basically they're paying uh, interest on debt, which 
compounds the situation and they're borrowing they're borrowing to pay interest on previous debt and so that it, it just just compounds on each other and that is not a linear thing that is an exponential thing and it's happening uh it's happening right now so nick you and i have spoken about cbdc's before are there governments that are making steps to impose such monetary systems or let's say updates since we last spoke about them well, one, well, yeah, one that is encouraging is uh, in El Salvador with uh, Najib Bukele because he was just reelected by a wide, wide, wide margin. Uh, so that is, I, I do not expect there to be CBDCs in El Salvador. Why? Because they've legalized Bitcoin as uh, as money in in the country, and uh, there's they don't have no need for this scam. And it is a scam because the it's just a uh, a new a rebrand of the fiat currency system, which is faltering. So it's kind of, it's it's like a desperate hail mary. So um, they are going to probably try these things. I don't think they're going to work out. We we could talk about why they won't work out. We've seen this them try to uh, do a sort of trial balloon in Nigeria that totally didn't work out. That was a total failure where they introduced the CBDC there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't I, I don't think you'll see a CBDC in El Salvador. I don't think you'll see a CBDC in Argentina either with uh, Millet. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens there. Uh, that's kind of more that's more uncertain than Bukele. Uh, in any case, e- even if the U.S. introduces one, I, I think it's going to be a total flop. I think it's going to be a signpost, a straw in the wind that uh, that this this fiat system is really at the, at the end of its days because it's not going to fix the fiat system. If you a CBDC would not have you actually forget the first CBDC was in Venezuela. Don't forget that that was the Venezuelan Petro. Uh, they introduced that a few years ago. Did that save the Venezuelan Bolivar? No. Would have a CBDC have saved the Lebanese lira? I don't think so. Would a CBDC have saved the the Zimbabwe dollar? Of course not. So these things, all a CBDC does is allow the government to engage in even more currency debasement. And uh, so, no, these things are inherently self, they're they're inevitable that they'll self-destruct is my is my uh, view. So I'm not too, yes, they look scary on paper, but the reality is, is they'll, self, they're, 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 they're inevitable they'll self-destruct. The only question is how long it'll take. I don't think it'll take long because there's ways you can opt out of the CBDC with Bitcoin, gold, and, and other things. And, uh, so yeah, I'm not too afraid of them. And if they're stupid enough to try them, I think they'll blow up pretty quickly. Yeah, it's I I just have this, you know, picture of a billboard in my head. CBDC fiat system now with more control and more debasement, right? That's what it is. Exactly. It's it just takes a crummy system and makes it worse. That's mm-hmm. basically what it is. And it's a it's a desperate, it's a desperation. Don't forget, people would never even be talking about CBDCs uh, if it weren't for uh, Bitcoin. And the reason is, is because central banks realized that Bitcoin is a competitor to what they do. And they didn't want Bitcoin to eat their lunch. So they're trying to compete with it in a very, very uh, uh, clumsy and pathetic way, uh, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, these the, the, the CBDC is the response that they feel pressure from a monetary competitor. And uh, it's a pretty pathetic response. You know, we can all imagine a time when, you know, there are alternative currencies used around a CBDC, whether that be existing cash, whether it be gold, silver, Bitcoin. So I want to get your take on if Bitcoin and gold in that respect, you know, serve the same purpose in that world. You said a moment ago that the government sees Bitcoin as a competitor, and it seems to me that they're are you know more on ramps and off ramps that they're able to close than they can with a physical asset so explain to us your thinking around bitcoin in that type of scenario yeah well you know bitcoin you can uh, use it peer to peer you don't need to use coinbase or these other off ramps there's plenty of peer to peer ways to do it uh, and you know to exchange it and what you got to do is you got to bootstrap these these circular economies so um, you know, the, yes, they can shut down the big the big institutions, but they can't shut down the peer to peer networks. And if there are, are people who have Bitcoin who want to sell serve or buy services with that Bitcoin, there's not really much they can do about it because all Bitcoin is is mathematics. It's just mathematics. It's totally impractical to ban. If you can memorize twelve words, which is how many uh, wallets back up their funds, if you can memorize twelve words or write down twelve words, you can store billions of dollars just in your head or on a piece of paper. Uh, 
that's it's all mathematics. It's 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 like trying to ban. If you want to try to ban Bitcoin, you, you might as well try to, to ban mathematics, uh, frankly, because this is what all it is. And uh, so I think the cat's out of the bag. I don't think they're going to be that stupid to try it. But let's say they did. You know, fine. You know, Bitcoin will just migrate somewhere else. Uh, many people have tried to ban Bitcoin. The Chinese government's tried to ban it many times. It hasn't really worked out for them, and they're one of the most authoritarian and powerful governments in the world. So, uh, you know, good luck. I, I think they have uh, bigger fish to fry. But um, if if they if they try it, I, I don't think they're going to be very very successful at it. Frankly, do you see silver in that same realm as well for you know an actual medium of exchange? I look. I think uh, the primary uh, store of values, uh, the, the best, are gold and Bitcoin. And over uh, so over a long term, they are going to have a competition. Gold and Bitcoin are certainly going to have a competition on who's going to be the best, uh, the best money, the best store of value. In the meantime, I don't think that's going to happen until the fiat system totally blows up. So I think the first thing that has to happen is the fiat system has to blow up. Uh, and in the meantime, while the fiat system is blowing up, I think gold, silver, and Bitcoin could all do well. But once all of the value has been deflated from the fiat system, we don't know how long that's going to take. Could take five years, could take 10 years, could take one year. We don't know. But when that happens, I just know that when that happens, after that happens, then there will be a, a, an honest competition between gold, silver, and Bitcoin. I think it'll mainly be between gold and Bitcoin because gold and, and Bitcoin have superior uh, store of value attributes. Silver, uh, yeah, I, you know, look, I think it's more, I, I think gold is a superior money than to silver in every way. So except maybe perhaps with smaller transactions, but that's not going to be a decisive uh, factor. I think gold is, is, uh, is going to be the premier uh, money. I think silver will be, you know, le a lesser form. And uh, in terms of emergencies, yes, maybe it's a, a, a nice to have some silver ounces to, you know, barter with the farmer or barter with the grocery store if you really, really needed to. Uh, but in uh, all other instances, I think gold is a is a superior money, and I think you, you you'd be wanting to look at uh, gold and, and Bitcoin in the in the wake of the collapsing fiat system. Nick, when we consider the fragility of these monetary systems, as we've been talking about, you also recently wrote an article that describes how fragile the world's oil market is. You know, ultimately being at the will of Iran and their control of the Strait of Hormuz. So, if they decide to close the Strait, what do you think the consequences on the oil price would be? Well, uh, you know, we looked at the previous oil shocks that came out of the Middle East in the '70s, uh, where oil prices, you know, doubled, tripled, quadrupled. I think that is a reasonable benchmark uh, here. Except, I think it could be even more profound. Um, and because the amount, the percentage of disruption to the uh, international oil markets that could come from the closing of the Strait of Hormuz is even more profound than the Arab oil embargoes of 1973. It's e more oil is going to be taken off the market on a percentage basis than happened then by far. So as a conservative estimate, I would say use that as a benchmark. Look at what happened in 1973. Uh, and, you know, I think oil prices like nearly tripled or more than tripled. I think you could look at that if they close down the Strait of Hormuz. That's the that's the conservative scenario, because the amount of oil that's going to be disrupted is even more than that. Uh, so the, can they do that? They absolutely can. Even the Pentagon knows that they can do that. The Pentagon has war gamed this. This is actually a fascinating story that most people don't know. The Pentagon, the most extensive war game in Pentagon history is something called Millennium Challenger. Uh, and it was uh, done uh, a while ago. I think it was done in, about 20 years ago. But nonetheless, it was the biggest Pentagon war game in, in the Pentagon's history. And it basically sh simulated a war between Iran and the U.S. And the amazing thing is, is that it was intended to prove that the U.S. could defeat Iran with ease. But the opposite thing happened because Iran was able to sink all of the warships in the Persian Gulf and effectively defeat the U.S. through asymmetric and unconventional means. Uh, and and it was a very embarrassing thing. So look up that war game. That is the proof that uh, that if there is a war with Iran, that it's not going to be a picnic. It's not going to be like going after Saddam Hussein. It's going to be very, very, very different uh, because Iran does have these advanced capabilities to to shut down the strait. These uh 
unconventional uh, warfare methods, sea mines, uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles. They use swarms of vessels that are very hard to stop. Drones, uh, you know, so this is going to be a mess. And the Strait of Hormuz is the most important oil uh, transit point in the entire world. Um, so look, Iran just has, a, that's their geopolitical trump card. They can only play that card once because once they play that card, then that means like they have a total war uh, going on with the United States. So they're not going to play that card very lightly. That would be like, you get to play that card once. So um, I wouldn't expect it to happen unless there is a total war with Iran, which is not impossible. That could very well happen. Um, I think it would be a, a total disaster, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it seems to be going in that direction. So we have to consider this as a possibility uh, uh, going forward, because looking at the geopolitical situation of the Middle East, a large regional war is absolutely in the cards. And that regional war will almost certainly center on Iran and its uh, its allies. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's looking at a, a mess of historical proportions. Well, another part of that I wanted to kind of touch on, Nick, is how much should we actually be worried about this considering all of the conflicts in that region? Is this something that we can, you know, let's say, have a reasonable expectation of actually happening? Uh, yeah, I think you can, uh, because... It is such an unstable, in, in short, you know, you have two kind of uh, opposite geopolitical forces in the Middle East. You have the U.S. and its allies, which are like Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Uh, and then on the other side, you kind of have Iran and its allies. And standing behind Iran and its allies are Russia and China. They're basically on the same geopolitical side. Mm -hmm. and, Ru and Iran's allies would be uh, various uh, militia groups in Iraq, militia groups in Lebanon, the state of Syria, various uh, Palestinian groups, and the Houthis in, in Yemen. Uh, the Houthis in Yemen are not to be taken uh, lightly. They just went through they went through ten almost ten years of war against Saudi Arabia and fought them to a standstill. Now, let me add this: the Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East, and Saudi Arabia is about the richest not the richest, but about the richest country. And that's a very fascinating story. You have the poorest country that basically defeated the richest country. Saudi Arabia has all the backing of the United States, political backing, military backing, financial backing. And they couldn't defeat these Yemenis. It's it's amazing. Nobody even talks about this. But this was and so this is they've kind of moved on. The Saudis have entered into peace talks with Yemen. They have zero appetite to go back to war against Yemen. So this is why the U.S. has not been able to stop the Houthis in Yemen from shutting down uh, shipping in the Red Sea, for example. They've been trying to bomb the Houthis, but guess what? The Houthis have no, know how to hide their missiles. They've been hiding them for 10 years from the Saudis, who have basically the same weapons as the U.S. So the U.S. is not going to be able, they've kind of They've kind of backed themselves into a corner because the U.S. is not going to be able to stop the Houthis from shutting down shipping in the Red Sea with airstrikes. It's not going to happen. So what are they going to do? Are they going to invade Yemen on the ground? That would be a total disaster. Yemen is a very inhospitable place for foreign invaders. It's very tribal. They're very well armed. They have lots of weapons there. And it's horrible terrain. It's mountainous, rough terrain. So the U.S. is going to get bogged down in another forever war that it's not going to win just to stop the Houthis from stopping shipping. I mean, they're in a bad situation. <laughs> they really kind of got backed into the corner here. Uh, and it would be even worse if they uh, tried to take on Iran. So my view is this. The, the geopolitical side of Iran and its allies are on the their ascendant. They are rising in the Middle East. And there's not much the U.S. can do about it except start a large regional war to try to turn things around. But that amounts to, like, it's like you get a bad hand in poker or you get a bad hand in blackjack and you're down and you've been down and you've lost a lot of money in blackjack and you get a dealt a bad hand and you try to double down on a bad hand to get even. That's what they'd be doing. They're basically taking a bad hand and doubling down to get even. Bad idea, bad idea. Uh, what they should be doing is looking for ways to reduce tensions find a negotiated settlement and uh and but that doesn't seem likely either so uh what do we have here uh we have at, at a minimum this kind of uh low intensity regional war that could explode into a high intensity regional war uh that will be very unfavorable to the US but in the meantime i just if, even if the current trends just continue there the US is slowly going to get pushed out of the middle east so that has huge geopolitical implications in and of itself uh, too, but that's just the way the trends are are going, and uh, that's that's what I see. So 
a lot of implications there, but that's that's the that, that's the geopolitical situation in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Nick, do you think this creates immense opportunities in oil related equities, especially in far removed jurisdictions from Iran and that Middle Eastern conflict zone? Yeah, I think it could. It absolutely could. But you got to be careful because it is very political. So, for example, you know, like before Russia and Ukraine went into war, uh, Russian oil stocks looked very attractive. They looked very they were away from a lot of these other conflict zones. They were very undervalued. Uh, and then sanctions hit and everybody who owned Gazprom, for example, had their shares frozen and seized. And they're still seized and frozen in your brokerage account to this day. So. Look, you know, it's very possible that this kind of stuff can happen. So you want to look at it. But then then again, you look at the oil companies in the West. Most of them are woke. Most of them are trying to, like, phase out their oil business, which is insane. So we're, it's tricky. Yes, theoretically, oil and hydrocarbons are a wonderful investment. But to navigate all of the political risk, the sanctions risk, the woke ESG crap, you're you're literally walking through a minefield here. So it is tricky. It is very tricky. Nick, with many countries' interests really involved in the current conflicts in the world, what do you see as the risk of a false flag situation occurring to set the pretenses for more active action? Oh, I think it's very high. I think it's very high, unfortunately, because if you look at how big wars uh, start, these this, the false flag is a common tactic, which basically means uh, one side is pretending, another side is attacking it to give it a pretext to go ahead and start a larger war. Unfortunately, this is a very common tactic. It's, hap- it's, it's happened many times throughout history. We don't need to go through all of the instances that it's happened it's very clear people can look them up but yes it's a big risk it's a very big risk and people uh, should be aware of it uh because i think that you know this is a card that they'll they they might want to play this card and, and we should be aware of it mm-hmm. nick you have a unique perspective being in argentina obviously there's been a lot of news about the new president javier Milei. so i'd like to get your perspective on you know, his winning the election and the changes that you have seen so far? Yeah, well, I spend a lot of time traveling, uh, in particular in South America and in particular in Argentina. So I'm familiar with uh, the situation there. Uh, Yeah, there's a lot of high hopes uh, for Milei. I mean, he's by far the most uh, free market oriented uh, leader ever elected anywhere in the world. So bravo to him. Good job. Uh, that being said, he's got a very, very, very difficult uh, task ahead of him. Um, and the mo- it's all going to come down to if he can deal with the money situation. The money situation is the root of all the problems uh, in this co- in Argentina, and he's got to fix that. Uh, one thing he's wanted to do is to dollarize, which might be a, a little bit of an improvement, but uh, you got a problem of, of sovereignty then. You know, you're going to be completely beholden to the United States. Uh, if you don't have your own money, very bad idea. They're going to jerk him around and push him around. If if they adopt, if, if Argentina adopts the dollar, they'll be like, well, guess what? You better send some money and some weapons to Ukraine or no more dollars for you. You're going to see a lot of this kind of strong arming and bullying. So I, I, you know, yeah, it's a step in the right direction. The ultimate idea, and he has articulated this, so I really hope, and he's also tried to put it into policy, so I really hope it sticks, I really hope it gets through, is that Argentina could repeal legal tender laws. What that means is that you just allow the market to determine what money should be, not government. Money does not need to come from government. It absolutely does not. This is just a a thing, a a misnomer that most people have been uh, brainwashed, frankly, into believing. Money doesn't need to come from the government. This is ridiculous. Money comes from the market. The market is where money comes from. So, uh, and Millet knows this. Millet absolutely knows this. He's talked about this. So we may actually get to see uh, a country return to a free market money, free market banking. We'll see. I, I, th- it's a chance. It's maybe a small chance, but it's still a chance. It's still very much up in the air, uh, and we'll see in the months months ahead. So uh, keep an eye on out for that. Well, you know that's what something I wanted to ask you as well is is do you think it's really too late and this entire system in Argentina just has to be, you know, for lack of a better word, reset rather than tying it to really a, another sinking fiat currency. 
Yeah, you know, look, I'm not in charge uh, here, uh, but, you know, that, yes, I think it probably does. I think the system is probably the the money system, not just in Argentina, around the world, to transition to not just from one fiat currency to another fiat currency, but out of the fiat system. That's what you want to do, and that is going to require a very drastic uh, and radical change anywhere, not just, not just in Argentina, but uh, it is going to happen, I think. Uh, because just the nature of these fiat currencies is that they're all self-destructing. They're all self-destructing. So the sooner that one country moves to a free market in money and banking, the better. Uh, it might be like taking some tough medicine now, but you're better off doing it now than later. So when we think about you know a relatively large country taking steps to ultimately let the free market choose its own money, do you think that ends up setting an example for the rest of the world? You know, we we saw El Salvador adopt Bitcoin as legal tender, but it doesn't seem to really have made much of an impact necessarily all in all of El Salvador, never mind the rest of the world. Yeah, I think it takes time. I think most people around the world, not just most Americans, not just most Westerners, have forgotten what real money is. And mm-hmm. it's going to take some time for them to rediscover that. Uh, that being said, Argentina is a much, much, much bigger country than El Salvador. Uh, El Salvador still uh, is is doing great things. Very excited to see what is going to come with uh, Bukele's uh, second term. That is a very positive thing for uh, human freedom in the world, frankly. Not just Bitcoin, not just people who live in El Salvador. It'll be, it's a wonderful thing for the world to have that kind of an example. Hopefully, Argentina can provide that kind of example, too. Uh, we're talking about turning around um, decades, over 50 years of bad policy. This doesn't happen overnight. Unfortunately, I'd like it to happen overnight, but it doesn't. Uh, the fiat system has been around for over 50 years, since 1971. And even before then, you you know, it was slowly put into place. So we really haven't had a free – people have long – even their grandparents don't even know what a free market in money is. So – this is this is something that it, it has been gone for a very long time, probably over a hundred years, and it's going to take some time to to get to it. But nonetheless, I think that's uh, the direction things are moving. Mm-hmm. Excellent, Nick. Well, I appreciate you shedding some light on all of these different subjects with us today. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, maybe before we wrap up? No, I think that's uh, that's pretty much it, Tom. I think we touched on a lot of uh, today's most important issues. And if uh, people are interested in, in learning more about uh, what I write about in my work, they can go to financialunderground.com. Got a uh, very helpful uh, free special report there about uh, different strategies on how to use gold and Bitcoin and and other uh, international diversification techniques to really uh, be able to th- survive and thrive in these uh, chaotic times ahead. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And of course, you're an excellent Twitter follow as well, at Nick GM Bruno. Nick, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Great to be with you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.